Hi, my name is Mark and welcome to The Active Listener, where we aim to listen, not just hear. We firmly believe that everyone has an interesting story to tell, if given the space to do so. So listen in to what our guests have to say. You may learn something. So welcome, Dr. Patrice. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to be here. Excellent. Thank you. It's great to have you here too. So tell us a bit about yourself. So I'm Dr. Patrice Carter and I live in the southeastern United States. So I'm very excited to be here with you um, sitting across the pond. (laughs) I'm a wife, a bonus mom and the CEO of Breakpoint Coaching LLC. He sounds like you're very busy. I try to be, well, in a balanced way, which we'll get into. (laughs) Excellent. One of the reasons you're on here, Dr. Patrice, is that you are a coach. So tell us a little bit about why coaching? That's a great question. So, and one of the things I thought about, you know, just briefly when you asked me that just really quickly is that I've always been that person that people could tell their stuff to in quotations. So I could be standing in the line at the grocery store or at an event or just being myself sitting in my office doing work when I worked traditionally and people would just come in and began to just download and share really personal and intimate details about their lives. And so I began to recognize early on that there was a pattern and a theme to that and that when they would speak to me, I would have a heart for them. I could feel their pain. I could feel their rage, I could feel their um, sadness or just their deep concerns. And so I was able to not only empathize, but to be able to channel that. And so one day I was there at my desk about 13 years ago, working a traditional job. And the Lord pressed on my spirit that I would become a life coach, that he had called me to be a life coach. And so I had no idea what a coach was at that time. And it was still a relatively new phenomenon here in the U.S., And so I began to um, just do a lot of research and looking into what coaches do and trying to find other coaches on LinkedIn and other mediums. And I just leaned into that journey and I said, yes, and it's been a 13 year adventure. It sounds like to me there's a lot going on there, but ultimately that there was a, a quality about you or something that enabled people to share. You're saying that, Lord, it sounds like there is a, some sort of conviction. You felt coaching was the way you were going in life. I did. I felt so strongly about it because when I felt that the Holy Spirit revealed that to me, it just felt so, um, it was like a puzzle piece being put into place because all the traditional jobs I'd worked, um, I began to have this longing to be self-employed. I didn't want to continue to work for a traditional employer. I wanted to work for myself, which I know was the Lord because I had no evidence at that point in my family of an entrepreneur who had quit their full-time job to go into full-time entrepreneurship or marketplace ministry, as I call it. And so I know it was that that unctioning and that conviction towards something bigger than myself. And it really aligned with who I am as a person, because even in the job where I was working, it was in mental health. And although I'm not a therapist or a counselor, um, I had an administrative role, I was able to work really closely with patients And it always blessed me to be able to just bring some type of light into their life or some type of positivity when I would have those encounters. So it all just became um, came full circle, kind of like Romans 8 and 28, where it says, now we know that all things work together. Wow. Thank you. So it sounds like uh, because you'd mentioned before and I I hadn't um, I hadn't kind of shared this at the beginning, uh, but you're what's called a spiritual coach. So I've heard of different types of coaching. I've certainly spoken to like an agile coach and I I know there's health coaches and so on. And uh, you did make reference to a life coach. So tell us a little bit about the sort of coaching you do and then we'll unpack a bit more as to how you got into it. So I um, refer to myself as a Christian life coach. And what that means is that in the process of coaching, um, we use, when I say we, myself, my faculty and my team and I, so we use a faith-based form of coaching uh, where the model itself can be applied secularly and non-secularly, uh, but it goes around a um, in a circular way that incorporates Jesus into that coaching conversation. So not only are we asking and listening, actively listening, if you will, but we're listening to not only the client, but we're listening to the Holy Spirit and bringing him into that. So through my company, through Breakpoint Coaching LLC, we certify, equip, and train Christian life coaches. And we do that through live course instruction and e-course instruction. 
And then I also mentor other life coaches who want to um, develop their own program. So if there's a life coach who has been working one-on-one with clients or working in a group setting, but they want to begin to develop a curriculum or e-courses of their own, then I teach them how to do that as well. It sounds like it's multifaceted. So you've got the side of the coaching, which you do yourself personally, but you also teach and enable other people to do the same thing. Correct. In terms of the coaching that you offer, is this to people that go to church? How do people get engaged with this type of coaching? That's a great question. So I believe that there is, well, one thing that's true that you stated, which there are so many different facets and avenues and ways to approach coaching. But the way that people get into Christian life coaching, at least in my experience, and a lot of people find me through our credentialing agency, um, they will go on specifically looking for a faith-based coaching program. And then also through social media. So I do a lot on social media and I have a YouTube channel. And so with that, on the YouTube channel, I've noticed that people, when they reach out to me, tell me specifically that they came on doing a search for Christian life coaches. So it's not so much necessarily, I would say people that are in the church, but I would say that it's people who are faith-based that recognize that like me 13 years ago, sitting at that desk, that God has called them to a higher purpose and that this is in alignment with the their ministry and their purpose here on earth is to walk with people in a coaching vein, uh, using the Holy Spirit as a partner and a guide in that process. Thank you. So it sounds like as as part of this coaching, you don't see it as something that it's just you. It's almost like it's in partnership with, with God or Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. as you would say. Correct. As an individual, what drives you? That's such a great question. What drives me is, and it, it might sound, I don't know, I kind of pause because I feel like sometimes people judge it, but it doesn't matter. It's truly who I am. I want so much for people. Um, And when I say I want so much for people, I want their healing. I want their wholeness. I want them to know the fullness of joy. I want them to have everything that God has afforded them. I want their life to be incredible and amazing. And so I say that really with tears in my eyes because I'm a suicide survivor and came out of a marriage previously where there was domestic violence. And so I just see how God can take a life and just turn it around and take a mess and make it into a huge message and then bring glory out of it. And so that is truly who I am. Just I walk very open heartedly in the earth, not in a way that is flighty or overly idealistic, but very much as someone who recognizes that there is good in everyone and that God wants to draw that out and take it and use it for purpose. And so I definitely would say that um, I look for diamonds in the rough because I felt like I was a diamond in the rough and I speak to that and to the underdog. So I hope that makes sense. What I must say is I I didn't know that. Thank you for being so candid. The question I'd ask then, kind of picking on from what you were saying and the heart that you have for people and wanting what's best for them and then, then growing and so on. And a little bit about what you said yourself in terms of your own background, what would be the difference, say, for instance, from the coach that you offer and you help other people develop and, and grow in and, say, counselling? That's a great question because there absolutely is a difference between coaching and counselling. And so the difference between um, how I show up as a coach versus a counsellor is that we know that counsellors are licensed, that they go to school to become therapists and counsellors, that they um, there's a legal component to that. But also counsellors are looking to um, lend a diagnosis. They're able to tell and to lead and to direct and to guide their clients and their patients, as opposed to us as coaches. While I may have the heart for that client, I walk fully from the standpoint that everything that they need is already within them. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth and that um, and eternity has been planted in our hearts. So as a coach, my responsibility is to connect with their heart, but also to take that knowledge that the Holy Spirit reveals and ask questions that draw them out and move them forward. So coaching is all, as you know, about moving forward, about setting goals and about helping the client unearth what is in their heart. So I don't do any telling. I don't do any leading, directing or guiding. But as God does give me revelation in the process of coaching with someone, he will also um, give me the right question to ask so that I'm not 
again, going into ministering to them. If there's a place that they share that is reverent or that is heartfelt that maybe it ties into my personal testimony, then I will ask them for permission to share um, so that I can share with them in that moment that they're not alone or that I understand or have empathy with where they are. But again, being certain to not take over the conversation as it were, but just yielding and lending support. In many respects, it's kind of like a version of the co-active model, this dance of insight where you're working with the client or the coachee. You're dancing with them in that sense because you've got this sort of general interest and you're sharing insight, but you're asking permission because ultimately that's still in the driving seat in that Mm -hmm. they're empowered to make decisions so therefore you're asking permission to share your mm-hmm. insight as you'd say absolutely and I love the dance because um, one I love to dance but there are certain partner dances where one person has to lead and the other person has to follow and I think that can be very challenging for us as coaches but not only coaches it's just human beings allowing someone that you know, maybe doesn't know the way to lead, but they really do know the way it's in their heart. It has just not become known yet. And so it's definitely also a a dance of humility. I think there is a real danger in, in coaching that you can turn into the, the fix it. You know, you've got all the answers and both as the coach, you can see things in that way, but also as the coachee, the client, they can come along and think, oh, you know, so and so they, they've got it together and they're going to give me the answers. And, and then there's this kind of like codependence almost. And no one wins in that other than yeah. ego. It's not good for the coachee. So I think you're absolutely right there. There's a humility and as a good coach, we should be willing to do that. But I think perhaps there's also elements there that how we can live our lives in general, isn't there, in terms of how we interact with people. That is so good. And you bring up an amazing point, Mark. And that is, I tell my coaches that I train all the time and I tell myself this, we have to quiet our inner fixer. You know, because if somebody comes up with a problem, I'm like, oh, man, I can fix your problem and fix your life in like 20 seconds flat. <laughs> but that's not why they're paying us and that's not why they've hired us. And that's not how God has called us. And so you're absolutely correct that we what I heard you say between the lines is when we go into fix it mode and telling mode and not actively listening, we're cheating them out of their reflection we're, we're cheating them out of their ability to heal themselves and to identify within themselves and to um, just really have new knowledge that will move their lives forward. And so we really have to operate from that heart standpoint that they're more important in that moment, that it's really all about them and not about us and what we know. So there's a book that um, that I read, um, that I've read and I read from constantly is by Dr. Keith Webb called The Coach Model. And in the first chapter, it's called Coaching Mindsets. He identifies a sickness that he says that we all have. It doesn't matter where you live or what your nationality is. And it's called know-it-allism. And he says it is a disease that runs rampant. (laughs) And that as a coach, we have to be really cognizant of not being a know-it-all. Because it's not about what we know. It's about what the client knows and needs to know. Yeah, I think that's, that's really powerful, isn't it? Again, uh, I suppose really whatever type of coaching you're in, that that sense of humility and not kidding yourself, you know, or as soon as you start doing that, probably to be fair in any profession, you know, you've you kind of failed because how can we ever know it all? Whilst there be similarities between people in terms of their background or case struggling with, they're also still unique to them as an individual. Mm-hmm. You know, so True. I think you're right there. We we have to to listen and and to understand. How do you remain motivated in what you do? So I remain motivated because 13 years ago, when I shared that, that's what the Lord came and said to me and told me who I was. I received it. I accepted it. I agreed with it, and so it just became my life's mission. And so. Because the Lord has done so much for me, and that might sound, again, I don't know how it sounds to people, but for me, having shared already that I'm a suicide survivor and have seen death multiple times and survived, and I think I don't look like what I've been through, I owe him everything. I owe him my life because he's given me my life back so many times in so many beautiful ways. And so with that, that's really the first motivator 
is just to bring him glory. And then the second motivator is, as I share, I just really do love people so much. Like that is just who I am. It came from my mother, my grandmother's. My father um, is a retired um, Marine veteran. And so I've been taught and shown and modeled service. So, you know, having a, a service mentality, a servant's heart. And then also I have an incredible team uh, that works with me at Breakpoint. And I have an incredible husband. And so when I say incredible, like I just have so much support for chasing after this goal and just living this dream every day. And I feel like it's not work. Like I literally get to just wake up and be a part of people's lives every day. Like who wouldn't want to do that? (laughs) And so the way that I personally stay motivated in more of a practical sense is I get up every morning before anyone else wakes up because I recharge through solitude. So I will come downstairs, get a great cup of coffee. Uh, I, know, I love tea too. So just in case any of my British brothers and sisters <laughs> are listening, my favorite tea is English breakfast. <laughs> so I will have <laughs> a cup of coffee most mornings. And then I will just sit and just meditate quietly um, or read a book or read you know, some scripture, read a devotional. And then I work out with a friend. So I work out with one of my friends who lives in Delaware here in the United States, but we work out on FaceTime and we pick the same YouTube video. So that is so fun. So that's how I start off my morning every morning. And then personality wise, I'm just an optimist anyway. So I'm probably a bit annoying um, because I'm definitely a cheerleader. (laughs) So I'm just constantly, you know, encouraging myself, encouraging other people. And um, that's what motivates me is just getting up every day, living on purpose. So there is that sense, you say, living on purpose. You're living with with a goal. Do you, do you set goals for yourself? And how do you go about achieving them? So I do set goals, but I say that sort of hesitantly because this year I've decided that at the beginning of this year, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let the Lord reveal to me what he wants for me. And I let the goals come to me. So when I say let the goals come to me, I think that in past years when I've set these huge resolutions and goals and I have gone after them and some of them I've achieved, some I haven't, they came with a bit of stress because if you set this goal and then you don't make it or you don't achieve it, then there's a sense of failure or loss or frustration. And I just don't want to keep feeling like that. So I decided to do something a little different this year. (laughs) And that is to um, just be prayerful about, you know, what the focus is and the intention is for the year and then just be in that space, if that makes sense. So with that, for instance, I feel like one of the focuses for this year for me is mentorship. So last year it was all about building the classes, building the faculty, building my business. But this year I've already achieved that. And while there's more that I want to achieve, Um, especially financially and just um, globally and expanding it, what I feel strongly about is giving back and helping other people that are coming behind me to grow and to have the knowledge that I wish I would have had, if that makes sense. So goal-wise, typically I will write them down, but instead of writing down goals this year, I'm writing down the word I hear, which is mentorship. And I hear the word expansion and elevation and enlargement. So anything that presents itself that is in alignment with what I feel I'm hearing in those ways, that's what I'm doing. And believing bigger. I hear the Lord say, believe bigger. So in practical sense, let's just bring it back to your original question. I would write it down. And then I used to, uh, last year I did something called quarterly boards. So I would have a giant sticky note and I would take the year and break it into four quarters And in each of those months, I would write the goals for the year. And every day that way, when I sat down for the month of January, for instance, or the month of February, I already knew what I was working on. And then if I didn't complete it, I would move it down. So I have a YouTube video on that if somebody wants to go and check that out. And that was very helpful. And I would do that again, but I just don't feel that too in this particular moment. You're talking a lot about the Lord. You were saying about he's shown you. You were, you're talking about the word motivation. So I'll unpack mm-hmm. that a little bit for us. What, what do you mean by that? So one of the things I was sharing earlier when you asked me, how do I stay motivated? I said, I get up every morning before anyone else and I go downstairs 
and I just sit still. So part of sitting still is just being prayerful, prayerfully still. So, you know, I ask God, what are we doing today? You know, what's the goal for today? Uh, what's on your heart and what do you have for me to do this year? And I'll just hear, you know, how people hear God different ways um, and they call God different things. <laughs> but I typically um, hear him just really as a whisper, um, not audibly like I'm talking to you, but there will be something that just drops in my spirit and I hear it strongly and it'll continue to repeat. And so I will hear words. So the words that I heard this year, which aligns with my desire, I want greater faith. I want to believe for the big things in my life and stop playing it small. So I heard the words, believe bigger. And then last year, as I shared, we grew a lot in the company. And so my company is not just a business, it's a marketplace ministry. And so everything that we do is ministry. So with that, I felt the Lord saying that he was going to expand it, enlarge it, and elevate it. And what he meant by that is because it is a ministry that I will have a greater reach, a wider reach. So it won't just be the U.S., it'll be the U.S. and abroad. It won't just be a certain type of people. It won't just be African-Americans. It may not just be Christians but it will be whomever he brings into it and enlarging it in that way and elevation, um, just a greater anointing, a greater level of faith. It's just, that's just how I hear it. Just those words. And so therefore, if anything presents as an opportunity, then I'm lining it up with that, that God has revealed to me according to those words. Is this going to elevate? Is this going to expand? Is this going to enlarge? Is it going to increase my faith? Or is it a distraction? And so going, bringing it full circle, that's why I think it's really important for people to just find time to sit with themselves as it relates to goals and what they want from their life and dreams and even purpose and really just get clear and go inside and, and just be, even if they're listening or they will listen and they're not a Christian Seeking your own counsel doesn't require necessarily any type of faith. It just requires just being still. That's um, really interesting, isn't it, in terms of knowing where you're going and what you want to pursue. From what you were saying, it makes me think of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yes. Um, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think the difficulty people often have is just sitting down, right, what is it that I actually want or how do I pursue that? How do I go about doing that when I'm perhaps stuck in my nine to five job and I don't really like it, but I've got to pay for the mortgage? How do I navigate that space? And that's a great response and a way to think about it. And so one thing that was hurtful and helpful for me and how I came to recognize and being still and just seeking my own counsel and getting quiet is because I was a person um, years ago who was a people pleaser. And I always asked people, what do you think I should do? You know, and I always wanted people to give me kind of like you were saying, people coming into coaching, wanting to be led and wanting to be told. And so when that happens, when we're that type of person, we end up being cheated out of our own heart's desire because we're always following after what someone else said we should do. And even in business that happens, people will come and tell you, oh, you should do this. Dr. Patrice, you should do this. You should do that. And then you end up chasing your tail. Or like they say in the military, it's a snipe hunt, which is a fictitious creature that you never find. <laughs> and so you end up chasing these snipes that don't even exist. And so I think it's just that's just so important. But also to your credit, something you share, which I think is huge which is being a person who works nine to five, but having a dream that is outside of that and wanting to own your own business. I want to speak to that person and say it's completely possible. So when I was sitting at my desk 13 years ago um, and the Lord said, hey, you're going to be a life coach. Remember I said I was working in mental health. I was making $80,000 a year. Um, that job was going to actually convert to a um, what we call a, a GS position here in the U.S., which would be six figures. I would be set for life benefits, flying to Europe every year. I hated every day of that job. And I would literally go and get on my knees and beg the Lord, please fire me from this job today. Like let today be the last day. <laughs> but he wouldn't fire me. But at that same space of sitting on that job, he was preparing me for entrepreneurship. Um, and so with that, when he said, you're going to be a coach, then I started working when I would get off work, 
I would go and research about coaching. When I started taking clients and I grew to that place of being ready to coach, then I would meet with clients on the weekend or I would meet with them in the evenings. So if you really have a desire to do something and you work a nine to five, it's going to, there's a saying in the Ranger Corps and the Army, embrace the suck. So you may have to embrace the suck for a little while. And it may, you know, you may lose some sleep or you may have to say no to some dinner dates and things like that. But if you really take the time to just build it on your lunch break, I would meet with clients on my lunch break in the car on the phone or get up before work. There's a way to do it to begin to work in alignment with that dream so that you can actually transition out of full time entrepreneurship. And then when you're ready, God will release you. And that's that's what happened for me. So I guess is that thing of drive if you feel either convicted or that it's something that you really want to do, you'll find a way. And I suppose really what we're saying is that it's a matter of making the most of the circumstances you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. So you recognize this confines to, okay, I'm working nine to five. What can I do with perhaps the time I do have? So maybe, you know, you're looking after the kids when you get home, but you say you've got that lunch break. So how can you utilize some of that time a lot of people are struggling with time at the moment in terms of juggling lots of things so I think it's really just distilling down what's possible isn't it yeah and then getting into agreement so when the Lord said this is who you are I agreed so if we get into agreement then that means we get into alignment and then when we're in alignment now part of that responsibility becomes God's well it's all his but part of that responsibility of clearing out that space to make room for this purpose that you have been called to this greater work God is going to move. And so when we align with that, then we get into partnership with heaven, then things begin to shift. The other thing you touched on that I think is really important is people are busy. And I don't mean that in a good way. Sometimes people are just too busy. And if I say that I have a desire to be a coach and I work a full-time job, but then I have my plate full of everything, I need to look at my plate and determine what on here aligns with my vision and dream and what doesn't? Some things you can't control. You got kids, you have a husband, you know, you have to take care of home and you and you have to take care of work. But if there's any fluff or any area that you can lean out, I highly suggest to lean your plate out, lean your schedule out and really just get hyper focused and know that because I'm coming from a faith based standpoint, that heaven is at your disposal and aid. Because even the Bible tells us that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witness. So one of the things I think is really prevalent, uh, certainly in the UK, I'm sure it is in the US and and all over the world, things like you know mental health. And we hear a lot about well-being, mm. and certainly over the last couple of years of the pandemic and people not being able to go out. In, I mean, in the UK, there's been several lockdowns, and 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 so that's been really hard for a lot yeah. of people. And we hear a lot about this sort of word resilience mm. in terms of how to cope. What, what does resilience mean to you? That is so good. I think it does. There's a vision board that I had made last year and I kept it up for two years. And one of the things that I put on there was a, a flame, a picture of a flame, a fire. And the words do more of things that set your heart on fire. So do more of the things that set your heart on fire. And so resilience to me is recognizing and acknowledging that this times are tough right now, um, that it's very challenging here in the earth realm, my goodness, in in so many respects. But then what are those things that set your soul on fire that you can tap into that will give you those moments of respite and cause that place of strength? So for me, going camping, you know, with my husband or just going for a hike or going outside, going for a walk doing the workout with my friend virtually, um, cooking something yummy, you know, (laughs) you know, whatever those things are. Some people is shopping, um, journaling. So resilience is just really being like that rubber band that still maintains its elasticity no matter how far it's stretched. But I believe that it comes with intentionality and not being overly stretched. And so part of that resilience also is recognizing what is causing you angst, What are your energy drainers and doing everything possible to cut those off? And part of resilience is recognizing if and when you need help. And so counseling is so critical. Therapy is so critical. I'm a huge advocate of helping, you know, of the helps. 
So if you need medication, medication. If it's just coaching, then coaching. You know, whatever that is. But also community is huge because we are so isolated. Every time we go into a lockdown or we have these places where everybody isn't in lockdown with someone. Some people are in lockdown alone. Or some people even out of lockdown are still alone. So I think fostering community is huge in terms of building resilience in whatever way that looks like for each individual. Community is very important. Community may be a cat or a dog, or if you just have one friend or one person and just really trying to lean into that, that can help you be resilient. Some of it is leaning into something that brings you alive or refreshes you, whether that mm-hmm. is camping and some people hate camping. But I know, right? <laughs> right. It's really, I suppose, what refreshes you as an individual, particularly those that have struggled who haven't seen people. Some people come alive in in the party. They've got people surrounding them. Mm-hmm. Other people need space to rejuvenate. So I guess it's what's, what nurtures you. Is probably yes. The, but also, too, I think just not being so narrow-minded about what's what we can't do. I believe that a resilient mind thinks about what is possible. What can I do? Because if we always think about it from the standpoint of what I can't do, then to me that creates a stop gap that you can't move beyond. Almost like a coaching session when you ask a client a question, they say, I don't know. You can't even get past, I don't know. What can we do if I don't know? (laughs) So what do we know? What can we do? And I believe that when we begin to think from that standpoint of empowerment, self-empowerment, then resilience is possible as well. That's the place of resiliency. What do I have control over? And releasing what I don't have control over. That's like one of the prayers, right, in the 12-step programs is that serenity prayer, knowing what you can change and what you can't change. It's almost like that sort of solution focus as well, focusing Mm -hmm. on what you can do to bring about a solution, what has worked in the past, mm-hmm. rather than focusing on what doesn't and what you can't do. You're you're looking at things in a in a positive manner. Mm-hmm. That's good. I like that. In regards to kind of life lessons, is there anything that really stands out at you? It sounds like you've had a, a very, very active, eventful life thus far. And uh, you served in the military as well. So there's, there's a whole heap of stuff that could go in there. Are, are there things, if you sort of look back from what's happened so far to where you are now, that you can say these are some real key lessons I've learned in life? So I joined the military at 35 and I had to get an age waiver. I was so old. Um, and 35 is not old by any means, but it is to join the military in the United States because there's an age cutoff I believe the age cutoff is 40, and I think it's 50 for medical professionals. So I had to get an age waiver because I was going in as an officer, and that would require a nine-year contract, which would put me over the age limit. I know, right? It's like, oh, God, nine years. (laughs) And so I remember going to – so they accepted my age waiver, and I remember showing up to my unit. And we had to run a PT test, which is a physical training, physical fitness test that you have to do every month or whatever. And I was completely out of shape. Mind you, I was a 30, I was not an active 35 year old. (laughs) And so part of the way that the United States military physical fitness program is set up, at least at that time, is based on your age. Everyone had to do the same thing. We had to run two miles. We had to do a certain number of push-ups and a certain number of sit-ups. But based on your age, you had a longer period of time or a shorter period of time. And you had to do this amount of push-ups, this amount of sit-ups, based on where you fell within that category. So we're out here. We're on the course. We're running the two miles. And a woman falls out in front of me. And so, mind you, I'm a person who likes helping people. So I'm here. The timer's going. And I had 20 minutes to run my two miles. But then when that lady fell, the other officer fell and um, began to convulse, I stopped to try to, you know, lend support. We're, now, this is a full medical unit with doctors, nurses. I'm not a doctor or nurse. I'm administrative. <laughs> so I come to try to help. And I end up failing the PT test because that messed up my, I didn't have time to finish. And so the company commander comes over to me and he says, hey, I want to give you some advice. He said, you didn't pass the test, but I'm going to let you take it again because I I know your heart that you wanted to help. He said, but you have to remember that this is your race and we're a medical unit. We always have medical support on standby. 
And so you need to run your own race and don't worry about other people in that moment because someone's there to take care of them. And then the other piece was that how this resonated with me is I was out here on the track as a 35 year old running with 200 other people, some of them 20 years old, some of them 19 years old. And so I would find that when they would run past me, I would try to run and keep up. And they had less time because they're younger. I had more time. And so when he said that, it really became a life lesson that I never forget to run your own race. Don't try to keep up with anybody else and don't slow down because of anyone else, but stay focused on your time, the time that you're in, the race that you're running and where you're going. I hope that makes sense. So run your race, stay focused on your own path and timing because someone's always going to be ahead of you. And there's always going to be somebody behind you. And there may be somebody with you, but your race is what matters. So that was the biggest lesson there. And then the other biggest lesson, as I shared earlier, is just going into your own heart and hearing from your heart what you want and need and honoring it. Because I didn't do that for so many years. And that's what led to me being suicidal. And so I recognized that I was, again, living for other people, putting other people ahead of myself, letting other voices in my head, and really not honoring my person. And so I think the most critical thing that any of us can do is to honor our own heart and to hear what it wants and to align our life on that. If, of course, it's speaking from a place of wisdom, sometimes we entertain folly. So I'm not saying that we need to just willy-nilly follow after everything that pops up in our head and heart. But I'm I'm speaking from a, a place of wisdom and, and truth and authenticity. What does your true authentic self want? And aligning with that. And that may mean the loss of some relationships. It may mean making huge shifts and pivots in your life. So to recap, run your own race and follow your heart. Thank you for sharing that. One of the things before we wrap up is tell us an interesting fact about yourself or something you're most proud of. So one of the things that is a fun fact about me is I have a twin sister and she is 14 minutes older than I am because I didn't know if I wanted to come out into this world. This is too much. <laughs> and now that I'm out here, I see why I waited 14 minutes to make my entrance. <laughs> and my parents did not have a name for me because my mom did not know that she was pregnant with twins. So they only had my sister's name. And I was a 14 minute surprise. And my dad had to leave the hospital and go buy a second set of everything. <laughs> That That's cool. That's a cool, interesting fact. Thank you. We do our favorite five. Favorite song or piece of music? So my favorite song that I'm playing on heavy rotation right now is Never Going Back by United Pursuit. It's about never going back to that place of despair, never going back to that place of hopelessness or all the places I've shared here with the listeners today, the dark places I've been. Um, but just it's all about going forward and running after the things that God has given us to live. You know, we have a great life and we need to be about living it every day. Very inspirational. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So a person uh, you admire. I want to say my parents, but I'm just going to take a, um, a author liberty because the Bible says two shall become one. So I'm going to treat them as a unit, a parental unit. <laughs> but because they've just gone through, you know, they've endured so many things and um, and they are just so wonderful and always such champions and supporters of me and my siblings and all that we do. So they are inspiring to me. I've seen them come from, you know, I know their story of coming from poverty and um, meeting at a military Catholic boarding school to having really great careers and raising a beautiful family. And they're still together, still alive. So that's inspiring to me. Food, what would you choose? Favorite food in the entire world is anything Thai. My two favorite, one will be Pud Thai uh, with vegetables and shrimp and or some type of coconut curry. Good choice. Like the green tapioca pudding, that's lovely. So favorite place? I love being at home because I'm a homebody and I feel safe and at peace here. But truly my favorite place out in the world is the ocean. It's anywhere on the beach. The minute you walk out there and it's, the expanse of it is just so large and you feel, I don't know, it's like you just can, can breathe because it's like this huge space opens up and it feels like this weight's lifted. I don't know. And then when you look out, it's like looking out on eternity because you can't see where it starts or ends. So it just feels so relaxing. And um, it's just a place where you can just really reflect and 
and just the shoreline, you know, just hearing the waves pound the shore is just very um, peaceful. Really, it's just a place of peace. Finally, book. I just finished reading this great book called Feeding the Soul by Tabitha Brown, and it is excellent. And I really highly recommend it. She is um, an African-American um, new writer, new author who is from North Carolina. So that really intrigued me because she's from, you know, my birthplace, my home place of North Carolina here in the Southeastern U.S. And it's just a book of wisdom and insight and life lessons that just really speak to the heart. And so I've really enjoyed that, Feeding the Soul by Tabitha Brown. Thank you. Well, Dr. Patrice, I really appreciate um, you giving your time up and for for being so candid in, in what you shared and, and give us an insight into um, a different type of coaching and all of the kind of knowledge and insight that you've brought with that has been really, really refreshing. So thank you for that. One thing I would love to share, if I could leave the listeners with maybe some questions they could ask themselves to kind of just tap into their heart this year, I would ask them to think about and maybe get some paper or journal in before they do this and sit in a quiet space and just write down what the Lord is saying. Ask themselves, what is the Lord saying? Or ask God, what is he saying? And then just be still and quiet and write what they hear. And I want them to write down the answer to this question. What do you really want? You know, what is it that you really want? And then think about how things would change for them if they were able to achieve those things that they now recognize in their heart. And then the last two things I would suggest they write down and sort of tap into is what are their top five values? And then looking at their life and asking themselves, does their life and their decisions and the things they're doing align with those values? So I will leave them with that, just that homework assignment, if you will, that self-work, self-assignment. And I just want to thank you so much. This has been such a gift and an honor um, to just be in this moment with you here on the Active Listener Podcast. And it's such a blessing and a gift. So I just pray that God blesses you and all your listeners and continues to expand, enlarge, and elevate you as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrice. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. Until next time, remember, help people feel valued. Listen. Don't just hear.